Now let's meet Executive Chef Colin Hazama. Um, welcome to the show, Colin. Thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. You know, just looking at you makes me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, but I want to I want to do something I've wanted to do with a chef for a long time. And can I see your hands? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, these are the hands that can slice a tomato faster than the blink of an eye, right? I try. I try. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, uh, there's been so much on net, uh, Netflix and um, and Prime about uh, movies about food and and um, uh, stories about food. My favorite one is called Delicious. In French, that's Delicieuse. <laughs> and it's about, it's about a chef who kind of creates the modern version of a restaurant um, in the um, 18th century before the French Revolution. And it's very interesting how, you know, we take so much for granted about chefs and restaurants and table dining and linen tablecloths, all that. Um, you know, and back in the 18th century, they were eating off wood. Um, they, the, the royalty, the nobility ate differently than the common folk. It was very different. And, and so we've had, you know, this experience, I mean, in the Western world, well, in the world in general, um, about, about food in the past couple hundred, 300, whatever it is, years. And, and, um, and so you're part of that, and you're moving the needle forward, and, you, you know, you, you make life worthwhile. <laughs> Thank you. <I> appreciate that. <laughs> food is food is so important, you know. And it's a great career. I often think of, um, you know, what I would do if I had to choose a career yet again. I probably I'd make my mother teach me. <laughs> oh, I, I, would I would be agree. I would be a chef. How did you get to be a chef? So uh, what's funny is, believe it or not, I was as a young child growing up. Uh, I always kind of had the love of being around my grandmothers. And so cooking with my grandmothers from the age of maybe six or seven, just having fun in the kitchen. But it wasn't until maybe I was about 11 or 12 or so that I really had this passion of, I loved eating. So, you know, I, I think every, especially every local boy in Hawaii, I mean, when you grow up, you just enjoy all the different cultures and the, the, the plantation lifestyles of growing up and understanding from your grandparents. And so for me, that was really what really inspired me to enjoy cooking. But being in the kitchen was so much more um, a, a different feel and different world to expose and see yourself with, you know, just being with the food and, and then touching and, and feeling the food for me, for me. Yeah, it is. It's tactile. It's touching. It is. And, and tasting. I mean, they're all, it's, it's sensory. The whole thing is sensory. And that means, in a sense, sensual. <laughs> <laughs> so at some point after the age of 11, um, you decided you could actually create a dish. You could actually go further than your grand, grandparents uh, showed you how. And, and what was that like? What was the revelation there? So uh, believe it or not, I actually attended uh, Marino High School. And we didn't have any uh, home ec or any type of uh, class like that. And I was into fine arts and I was an athlete. And so it wasn't until I was about uh, 16 or 17, I had my senior project. And I said, let me, let me do culinary, the culinary world. And so uh, there was only maybe one other student that uh, also chose that uh, in my graduating class. And so I went into that. And fortunately enough, I was uh, with couple of my aunts one day and they both actually had a very very famous uh, chef and friend that they connected with and that was uh, of course uh, chef Alan Wong and so in high school it was toward my I think my second semester where I was lucky enough to get a opportunity to go in and basically in the kitchen. I started as a dishwasher and prep cook, and he gave me that opportunity just to get my hands dirty and get in there and uh, see what it was like. And so I do, you know, owe a lot to Chef Alan Wong for, he was uh, definitely one of my biggest mentors for showing me what the real kitchen was like. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to get in as my first job and then get culinary job to be in one of the best restaurants in Hawaii. Wow, that is something. So, he showed you what 
the kitchen is really like. What yes. is the kitchen really like? What is the heart of it? The heart of the kitchen is it's a lot of things, a lot of things going on. And, and, and really, when you're in the kitchen, you really have to come in and be very tactful and make sure that, you know, there's definitely no horse playing at all. You know, you really need to be aware of your surroundings. Uh, you're working with a multitude of different equipment as well as different aspects of with people and working with that teamwork aspect is really what puts together a kitchen and what puts that food on that plate and makes that you know that palette you know the plate is a palette it's it's, it's how you how you want to resemble as well as uh, showcase food and so being able when you get in the kitchen you need to really be able to exemplify the feelings and make sure that you know you work together and listen listening is the, the biggest key communication for sure and 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 the funny thing about uh, being in the kitchen is a lot of the times when we're going to service there is some talking but there's also a lot of just movement and you kind of dance and you flow and you, you you feel what your other partner is doing and and that's how you know that you kind of get that rhythm or that type of orchestration going on orchestration so you're you're aware of everything that happens in the kitchen. You know, this reminds me, you know, I mean, my, my earlier career was a lawyer. And if I went into a courtroom, uh, my sight, my, my, my senses were heightened. And, um, and I think every, every lawyer who goes into a courtroom has this experience. You are aware of everyone in the courtroom. You are aware of what everyone is doing. Every single motion, every, I mean, every, every hand motion, every sitting, standing, whatever it is, everything. And um, I, I expect it's the same way in a kitchen. If you're, especially if you're the chef, you're aware of what everybody is doing. Every single person is doing and you're, as you said, orchestrating. So they're all responding to you. You have to make sure that they are listening, hearing, doing what you expect, right? That's, that is the goal. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, coming up and, I think for me, working my way from the bottom and then getting opportunities and working under great mentors is definitely something that uh, has given me the opportunities to um, well, move up in my career and, and, and be able to see and work with uh, different aspects of, of, of just ki kitchen as well as you know working with people. I think that's the biggest thing like any profession, it's really networking and working with people. Sure. You know, they, they always said in my practice, they always said real estate is not about land, it's about people. As a matter of fact, everything is about people. <laughs> 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 you know, um, so the other thing about a kitchen, I was trying to, you know, uh, uh, sort of ideate what, what you do as a chef. And one of the things uh, that, I, that I was concerned about is, as you said, there's equipment there. There's knives there. There's cutting machines there. There's things that are hot there. Um, and, there's, you know, to me, I would be intimidated. I, I know that I put my hand down on a skillet in about five minutes. Um, and so the question is, how, how do you feel about that? And what do you do to make it safe? Well, I would say, definitely have to say that a lot has to do with, you know, just being able to be mentored and, and being in the kitchen, knowing that you are dealing with these things, um, just kind of knowing, and, oh, I, you know, fortunately I got to go to culinary school, but I think on the job, I definitely learned a lot of uh, real life aspects of things. And, and some of that, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, I, you know, got cut or I, you know, did get burned. And, 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 and some of those times are, are the learning experiences that, that happen. But for the most aspect, it's just, like you said, being aware of your surroundings and making sure that you are definitely, you know, paying attention to what's happening, what's going around. And so the safety of training uh, your cooks, training your people, being aware of when you are doing something to focus on, you know, if you're going to use the meat slicer, that, hey, all limbs, all safety guards must be in uh, action. Make sure that after you are done with it, you turn it off, you turn it to zero so that if there is some type of instance or scenario where somebody does touch a, a product or something, 
you know, your safety is, is, is happening. And of course, with heat, you know, being a, a, aware of when you're putting on, you're cooking on with heat, that you're always paying attention to it and never leaving the stove or leaving the, um, the, the, the burners going without anybody paying attention to it or, or occupying it, for sure. Now, how does uh, COVID change all this? Um, you know, does COVID change the way that you approach, um, you know, touching the food, um, being close to the food or your, uh, or your, you know, staff in a kitchen these days? Has COVID changed the way kitchens work? Uh, I would say that COVID has definitely, uh, I don't want to say if it changed it, but it definitely has I think put things a little more on a microscope in the fact of just being more uh, cautious and being more uh, in terms of your sanitation and, and really enhancing the fact of making sure that everything that you're touching, everything that you're taking care of or putting away or, or, or dealing with uh, in your colleagues is just using the food safety sanitation uh, practices even more so almost, you know, through the lens of a microscope, you're even even more in detail, mm -hmm. and and I think it just is a it was a good way of being able to really get involved with the food and the product even more so, and and sometimes you know you get into the business and you get so caught up and you're so busy with what's what's happening, but with you know with the pandemic, it actually I think for for myself in the kitchen, it, it allowed me to be able to do things even more so in, in the kitchen. So. I, I really say that that's the one thing that happened. So, you know, I get it when you say that you have to watch and supervise your staff to make sure that they are faithful to some recipe that you come up with. In other words, you design a recipe, it's a creative experience, um, and you tell them, you know, this is what it, this is these ingredients, this is the way you, 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 you build it, this is the way you present it, put it on the plate, and so forth. Um, you have to watch them you know, because it has to be somewhat consistent. I mean, you know that the patrons outside want consistency. If they order a certain kind of dish on day one, they want it to look and taste like the same thing on day three. Um, otherwise, people are wondering what's going on in the kitchen. <clears throat> but the you know the other thing is you know I mean I'm an outsider and I and I know as much about um, cooking as I do about movies. Um, and so everybody goes through this journey and the journey is you come in there, you do the scut work, you clean the pots and pans. And one day the, the chef will trust you with the food. Um, and then after a while, sometimes years, I remember, you know, if you go to France and, and you go into these chateaus and all this, you find, uh, people from all over the world doing, you know, menial things in the kitchen just to be close to the chef. They just want to watch the chef. That's all. <laughs> anyway, so uh, you, you, so you're working menial things, helping others, and then one day, aha, um, Eureka! Uh, the chef has given you permission to try a dish, to create something, um, and and then you're off and running because now you're in the creative sphere of all of this. You know, making new new formulations, uh, new preparations, and so forth. Can you talk about your own journey in that regard? Uh, when you got to the point where one of the chefs you were working under said, you know, um, hey, Colin, try it yourself. I want to see what you can do. So it's funny you, you mentioned that. Uh, it, I would say almost every restaurant or every chef that I worked for, there was that one opportunity and, you know, it, it usually takes at least six months to a year to build up, to really build that relationship with, with the chef. But I, I did get, uh, even with Chef Allen, just to even do, for instance, he would challenge us to, to make a, a soup, per se, and to even be able to have him taste that. And everything he does, is, it's all about taste, as well as uh, Chef Roy Amaguchi, they, it, that's the biggest thing they always would, would teach me and mentor me is it's taste your food, taste, taste, taste. And so if you build that relationship and the trust of just understanding their palate and getting that taste was the first step. And then that second step was then trying to evolve and see what you were learned, what you learned or gained and were mentored to now put that together and 
fuse together a little creative aspect of your touch into their food. And so it, it was probably about, like I said, maybe about six to eight months where uh, for Chef Alan Wong, when I was working with him, I got to create my own uh, soup. And so, you know, I, I first being young, I, I, I kind of went outside of the box and tried to do something new and creative when I uh, should have just went and did something that was from his uh, region, regional cuisine and just uplifted it and elevated it a little bit. So the first time I did try something for him, he, he just wasn't uh, too impressed with it. But, <laughs> but as you learn and as you grow, I, I then took all the knowledge that he was teaching me and I did a dish and I fused, I did like a, a, a fuse of a red curry. Uh, it was kind of a fused red curry, but showcasing and utilizing local ingredients uh, from the local farms. And I put a little bit of taro and and, 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 and as well as uh, we had some local uh, shrimp um, from, from Kauai. And, and so that was something that I, I just, when you get that, okay or that nod it just it really hits you at home and makes you feel good and uh, another experience was when i was actually working in uh, san francisco i was working i i got to also be mentored by chef roy amaguchi and so i got to create a dish uh, we had uh, he's well known for all his fish dishes and you know in, in the restaurant in san francisco it, it was it was a busy restaurant we did like anywhere from high 200s up to like 400 covers you know being in the city uh, Chef Ramaguchi was like the hot spot, you know, with the Pacific Rim fusion. And so I did touch and create a, a dish using his base sauces and fusing it and just do a nice little different crust out, uh, for, for a dish. And, you know, because Chef is always all over a different uh, continent, you know, he, he wasn't able to taste it, but my executive chef of the restaurant did allow me to do a special. And it, it sold really well. So I, I think just being able to understand and and work with what ingredients, but also bring a new elevation by maybe just putting a new different type of sauce or a, a puree or some type of new texture aspect that makes people feel like it's fresh and new, but a little different than the signature of dishes is something that for me just makes me enjoy. So, yeah, you know, Colin, one of the movies I'm thinking of when I mention all my movie experience on Netflix about food. It's called Pig, P-I-G. Nicholas Cage, he plays the role, and I, there might be some truth to this, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, a very notable chef in Seattle, okay? And one of the comments he makes that, you know, your, your, your story reminds me of, is he said, you know, he never forgot a recipe, never forgot a patron. Uh, he had it in his brain. He had it all tucked away. Um, and, and, I, and I wonder if a chef that creates something like this um, keeps it in his brain or in a, in a, in a little uh, three by five index file box. Um, how do you remember all, you know, all the, all the creative recipes you've designed? Is it all in your brain? Um, no, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, there are, are, are times and things, and a lot has to do with, to be honest with you, is memories. And, and for me nowadays, it's, it's going back into taking things from the past and then saying, hey, how can I elevate that past, that experience? And it, it could be something as well as my, my grandmother making me oxtail soup. But now elevating it to a point where the locals or the, the common people uh, kind of transcend and have that type of homey feeling and flavors, but yet elevating it to something that's different. Because I think that's all what's, what's happening with food. It, it just continues to evolve. And, and it, it comes back in full circle of bringing back childhood memories. And so mm. for me, it can be something of from the past, but also going out to eat and trying what's new, what's happening with the trends and always keeping that, um, that little edge of what's new, what's to come uh, is something. And, and what I do is if I do eat something or I do remember something, I take a picture and then just jot a little note or something and, and say, hey, maybe you know, I can go to a restaurant uh, maybe a sushi bar and the flavor of say a chef sushi chef putting foie gras on sushi it was at first when I first had that I was like this is very creative and and then saying maybe I can apply some type of flavor with that and do it in a little more upscale dish and you know that's that's just how it kind of starts to snowball and, and that's kind of how 
things happen any world with dishes out there. Oh, that's oh, that's fabulous. You know, your comment reminds me of Marcel Proust, who was a 19th century French writer. Um, and um, he wrote a book called Remembrance of Things Past and talks about a certain bre breakfast roll called uh, Petit Madeleine, a, a small Madeleine roll. And, uh, and how one bite of this Madeleine roll um, took him through the keyhole of his memory into his childhood. And, and he was flooded with all these you know, wonderful memories of his of his home and his family. Um, and, you know, I think there's something more than just the literature there. Um, from what you say, I mean, it sounds like food, food is, it, it, it's a reference point. Food helps you integrate, you know, the parts of your life. Um, food brings thoughts to your mind that you would not otherwise have. Um, and so it becomes, um, you know, an enhancement of your existence on the planet. Agree, disagree? I would definitely agree. I would definitely agree. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it can just change and evolve. And that food is, you know, we all have to eat. And so it, it also is about bringing, I think, uh, people together. And that's what I would say, you know, when we, you have a celebration, what do you do? You have food when you when you want to bring into meeting someone into a new culture a new environment they usually offer some type of their cultural food and so i think as a whole as humans have you know developed and grown in in, in the different centuries of things there was always a way of trade with spices in, in fact you know you would you would trade there in the back in the ancient days they trade spices in the new world to the old world for for gold and and you know, it's it's definitely to a point where I think even more so now food has become to the value of jewels and gold. <laughs> and you know, there's some ingredients and products that <laughs> cost those type of values, you know, <laughs> with truffles and different certain exotic spices that you can get. I mean, they're over over five hundred, over a thousand dollars a pound now. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I can't go to that restaurant. <laughs> So, you know, that takes me, you know, even a step further. I mean, in Hawaii, as you mentioned, is it's um, a celebration of many kinds of foods, you know, and, and and a chef familiar with that like you can really take it to the moon. Um, you, you know, you can talk about all these cultures and all the blending of the cultures, you know, the fusion with Yamaguchi and Wang. This is an extraordinary experience, you know, for you, for them, and for us. Um, but the question I put to you is this. If we're looking for... Uh, the Proust keyhole and the Petit Madeleine, and we're trying to achieve, um, you know, a, a connection uh, with, with times gone by. Um, which which part of the fusion do you pick? Do you pick the Japanese? Do you pick you know, the Filipino? Do you you pick the Howley? What do you pick in order to achieve that effect? Oh, that's a tough one. I, I would I would say I, I can't really just choose one. I wouldn't say it's it's a little of everything, really. And, and that's what makes, I think, Hawaii this mecca of the cultural diversity of not just our people, but also the flavors of food. And that's why it's such a melting pot, as everyone says, but in making sure that we can kind of experience and learn um, not just the, the cultural aspects, but also the techniques of the cuisine and, and applying them with you know, mo with modern technique now, with all this uh, new style of cooking with uh, molecular gastronomy and, and understanding how to take a dish and elevating it to, you know, a whole nother realm is what basically I feel chefs have really done to kind of put even more so Hawaii on the map. I mean, like like you said, Chef, Chef Alan Wong and Chef Roy Amaguchi definitely have made and put Hawaii on the map. And even more so now with the generations to come, we have to keep transcending and inspiring. And people, you know, for instance, poke. I mean, poke is all over the world. And and that's one of the just things that are happening with, with food from Hawaii and the trends. And with media and social media and with television, it's, it's a good way of just diversifying and putting Hawaii on the map, per se. Yeah, absolutely. We could be, should be famous for that. 
you know it's it's our diversity it's it's um it's our multiple cultures it's it's what we love about the place and what they love about the place um really extraordinary so now you know you've been at um, a lot of restaurants on the mainland you've you've sampled and you've cooked all over the place on the mainland it's a, you know it's a it's a lucky break and, and it goes far beyond just going to culinary culinary school um it's kind of um it's 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 a a real uh, what am I looking for? A real politic <laughs> kind of experience. But here you are. Now you're the chief chef um, of the Hawaii Food and uh, Wine Festival, which is very well known. And query, what does that mean to you? And what does it mean to the, you know, the the process of getting the word out on Hawaii's special uh, characteristics in food? All right, I'm I'm definitely. Uh humble for sure and honored to have uh, a opportunity to work with uh, these world-class chefs from around the world as well as in Hawaii and it, it it's it's a way of being able to kind of exemplify and showcase really what we have to offer here in Hawaii and um, you know I'm very fortunate with uh, Denise Amaguchi um, who is this our CEO and she, you know I've being able to be a participant for about nine years out of the 12. And, you know, with, with Chef Allen and Chef Roy, who basically select uh, who they feel are the chefs to participate. And, and, and it varies and it changes depending on what events or what's happening and going on. It's, it's definitely just an honor to be able to be now a part into organizing uh, the function and work with these chefs to uh, come together to the table and, and get them the products and get them their 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 dish or the ingredients and, and um, execute the events for what they need. You know, I was previously uh, executive chef at the Royal Hawaiian, and so I'm very used to doing large events or even you know the restaurant um, um, smaller venue, but more so doing these huge functions and banquets and pulling the different players together. So in orchestrating and coordinating that, I feel that. It's uh, one thing that I feel I could assist and help to bring to the table. So it's it's definitely a great, great opportunity. Tell, tell us how the festival works and tell us how the executive chef of the festival works to make it happen. So the festival works uh, in, in, in ways of the fact that we first start off with our events in Maui uh, and we have, uh, which is a, Kind of tradition, we have uh, Chef Roy does a golf tournament, which starts off in um, the middle of actually October 23rd and uh, sorry, October 21st. And that is where we start off and we have uh, participants enter a golf tournament and we have chefs featured there um, between each course. And, you know, we then go to uh, we have an event in Sheraton, Maui, which is a, a grazing galley, a grazing event. And then we have a galley event. Um, that Sunday over at the Royal uh, Lahaina. And so what it does, what it means is, you know, we basically bring chefs from different parts of the nation as well as outside of the world, um, outside of different countries. And we organize to make sure that we first send them the opportunity to offer. They then let, let us know what dish they would like to uh, showcase and create and fit into the theme of what we're doing. So, uh, for instance, that night we we're, were doing the dinner at the Royal Lahaina, um, Royal Lahaina, I'm sorry. It It's actually uh, basically Starred Beers and Diamonds. So, so we're talking about Michelin star chefs, uh, chefs who have won James Beard Awards. So we have a definitely high profile uh, named chefs there. Um, and so they definitely are going to want to showcase what, they, what they're known for. And so it's about making sure that we can source uh, the right ingredients. Um, the chefs all have to feature at least one local ingredient from Hawaii. Um, but also, you know, some chefs like to use almost everything from Hawaii and some like to bring things from where they're known for and what they can create. And, and it, it's, it's what's such a great experience because you get to have a chef from say New York city come down and bring some of their product or bring their flavors and their um, technique and showcase it into your, the dinner that you're having for that evening. And then we also have that paired with wine pairings from uh, 
you know, vineyards and, and, and from usually we have uh, Chris Rommel or, or, and Warren Sean who work through Southern Wine and Spirits, Southern Vages Wine and Spirits who pair those uh, dishes with, with the wine pairing. So it's, it's, it's a phenomenal experience. And then we also have mixologists that are coming from New York, San Francisco, as well as our local talent we have here in Hawaii. And bakers? And bakers, yes. Pastry chefs. We have, uh, we have great pastry chefs here in Hawaii. You know, we have Michelle Carr, Yoka. Uh, we have um, uh, Joanne Chang, who's coming over from Boston. Uh, we have a few others coming in from the West Coast. And, you know, just to name a few. But the pastry department is just elevated. And we have some chefs that do multiple. They can do savory and uh, pastry. You know, we also have, uh, uh, like, for instance, a, a chef who does that is, um, we have uh, sorry, Gail, Chef Gail Gan, who comes from Chicago. And we also have uh, a chef from uh, California, who also from San Francisco, who she just embodies and makes uh, great bread. She grated La Brea bread. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of a little uh, blank on her name, but she, she'll, she'll come to me. <laughs> Nancy Silverton, <laughs> Chef Nancy Silverton. I mean, everyone knows. So what is the executive there. chef? What are you doing all of this? It sounds like, you know, you have to manage all this and you have to help make the selections of who is invited and um, maybe take a look at their recipes and tell them they, they need a little more time. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I, I'm, I'm, my, my role is to uh, to basically orchestrate and put, that, put it all together and make sure that... Uh, we can have these multitudes of talent and be able to execute the events, coordinate, make sure I get all the equipment, make sure I get all the products and ingredients and make sure that, yeah, it's the right fit of, of players. Um, chef Alan Wong and Chef Roy Amaguchi are the ones who select uh, the, the chefs that are invited. Um, but it's also um, my decision to make sure that in doing so, when we plan and we organize things that, you know, if there's some type of hiccup or something that's needed or last minute needs to be adjusted or fixed, that I, I make the decision and, and that you know, so that we all can be executing to excellence, basically. How can I come? How can I be part of this? I, I'm getting hungry. All right. Well, so, you know, if, if you're interested and you want to um, buy tickets, we're at hawaiifoodandwinefestival.com. And we have tickets that are showcased from, you know, anywhere from $150 up to $1,500. Oh. And that's, and that's, you know, it's really what you want for that experience. So, you know, some may say that, oh, it's it's this cost point or that sounds pricey. It's actually not. I mean, where are you going to be able to get these high class, high level food experiences as well as wine pairings? And you don't just get to have just a small one bite. You know, if you're if you're entering and, and going to, for instance, uh, uh, Momo at the Tiger, uh, which is at the Alohilani Resort here, uh, Thursday, November second, uh, I think. It's it's like you have Chef Iron Chef Morimo over there. You have Chef Ming Tsai. You have chefs, uh, local, a few local chefs here. Uh, I think Chef Andrew Lay is there. And then you have chefs from other parts of, of California and New York City that are just phenomenal uh, chefs. And to be able to experience that all in one evening, I mean, that's you can't, you can't buy that. What about, uh, you know, the, the, the truly international types? I mean... You're talking about, um, you know, American uh, chefs and food um, but and restaurants. But, you know, what about Ulan Bator? Um, what, what about uh, Lagos or Kampala in, in Africa? What, 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 about, um, what about Madrid and Gazpacho? Um, can I get some of that? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think that's, that's the next direction that, uh, you know, Chef Alan and Chef Roy will, will choose, and it's about the relationship that they built. But we 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 did have a lot of chefs from you know Southeast Asia. We did have a, a chef from Mexico, um, and you know it's just it's also about the availability of, of the chef. So we do invite certain chefs from even different parts of, of the world and other countries. But sometimes, fortunately, unfortunately, they have another obligation, or you know they're just so popular, so famous that we we. We can't seem to get them on that certain date. So, you know, it, it's it's definitely something that we're working towards to get, for sure. You know, Denise Yamaguchi, uh, I guess she's your chief executive at, at the, um, the Food and Wine Festival. 
um, is into um, local agriculture. And you mentioned that a minute ago. And I wonder uh, what, what role that plays um, in, in, you know, in the festival in general, because uh, we do, we do want to build a, a local agricultural industry for lots of reasons, and including, you know, sustainability of, and, you know, food, food um, security in the islands. Um, what, what role does that play and, and, and how ubiquitous is it around all these, uh, you know, these, these participants uh, in the festival? Oh, it plays a big role for sure. And I think you know, the one main thing that we want to uh, showcase in for the Hawaii Food and Wine Festival is that it's a spotlight, is to really spotlight Hawaii as a culinary destination, other than our local ingredients and in supporting the local culinary talent that we have here in Hawaii. So showcasing and marketing our agriculture and really putting behind all of that is really what is the whole idea in building up chefs from around the world to utilize and you and showcase local Hawaii product, whether it's for fishermen, to ranchers, to our produce and our farmers, um, they come here to get some of the best ingredients in the world and showcase some of the best ingredients in the world. You know, and and really putting all this behind. You know, we we are a majority nonprofit organization where we've raised basically over three point one million dollars toward the local community, as well as to the educational for the schools of, of Hawaii. And, you know, the next generation is really what is going to be uh, the students of Hawaii for the culinary programs. Yeah, that's, and that uh, raises the whole issue of, of renewal, you know. Um, restaurants, some restaurants uh, last for a lifetime. The restaurants uh, that existed when you and I were toddlers. Um, and uh, or I was a toddler anyway. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and some restaurants, um, you know, they 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 have a useful life of a couple three years and they're gone. Um, and if Hawaii wants to be, you know, a, a, the center, the a food hub, if you will, a restaurant and fine dining food hub in the Pacific or or Asia Pacific or the world, you know, uh, which of course enhances its tourist uh, attraction. Um, we have to do some stuff because right now some restaurants have been, you know, essentially put out of business by COVID um, and not, but not all, some of them are doing are thriving. So what do we have to do to make Hawaii a food hub? What do we have to do recognizing that some restaurants aren't going to make it just the way of the world, not only here. Uh, what do we have to do to, to bring this special biochemistry of yours uh, out to the point where it's recognized everywhere by everybody. Well, I think Jay, for for one, I think, and everybody knows this and and really understands it and and supports that is is really supporting local, and and really supporting supporting your local businesses, your local restaurants, local mom and pop shops, but also as much as possible buying local ingredients, buying the local product from the farmers, because not only does it provide the jobs, but it's also about being able to sustain. And when I say sustain, we, I don't know if everyone really knows, understands, but we import over 90% of all our food that we consume from mainland, from the mainland. And so, you know, we need to really start reflecting on looking at showcasing and buying more and more ingredients that we can from Hawaii. And, and you know, with now they're, you know, doing the more uh, funding to do more for the farmers and getting more land advised and really just getting there to as much as possible, uh, you know, even getting to like farmers markets is for one thing, and being able to understand and see what they do out there. Um, and also, you know, going to the farms is another experience. And so what's good about a lot of the schools that I've um, been to, I've done things with uh, programs with, with, with not just culinary schools, but even for um, elementary and, and high schools is how they're building and cultivating that into their curriculum now about, you know, the sustainability. For instance, you know, we're doing this uh, big event for Call Around the World, which is showcasing five chefs from our uh, either previous chefs or chefs that are um, here for the event this year and showing, showcasing what it is about with the Kalo and how it's such a um, diverse um, product and ingredient here in Hawaii. And that's just one idea, one aspect of 
what I think we need to do is educate the community, educate the public a little more about the local ingredients and local products. It's really important. You know, it's a special talent and cultural cultural value that we have. We, we have to use it. Um, and it's modern. It's high tech. It really is uh, talking with you. And so uh, it's a great career you have, Colin. Congratulations on that. And congratulations on being the executive chef of the Hawaii Food and Wine Festival and oh, being part, so part of this. Yeah. Uh, I, but I do, you know, I asked you at the start of the show uh, to show us your hands because I wanted to just examine the chef's <laughs> <laughs> hands. But now I have a, a, an even more invasive question, if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. Colin Hazama, executive chef of the Hawaii Food and Wine Festival. What is your favorite dish? <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I would have to say that my favorite dish that I, to me, have created is is a kompachi from the Big Island. It's a it's a, a, a farm raised fish uh, in in Hawaiian. It's called kahala, but it's it's a a kompachi which I then slow cook. I actually poach it with olive oil and a little aromatics of herbs and lemon. And then after I poach it, I then serve it with a three caviar relish and local ama ebi, which was then fried, or crispy fry the head. And then I serve the tail nice and kind of torch so it's a little raw. And to me, pairing those flavors, um, I also pair it with a little bit of watermelon radish and some watercress from Sumida Farms. Uh, that's just a little bitter tones a little uh, sweetness from the shrimp. And then also I make a dashi sauce um, with a little white soy. And so it's a kompachi, poached kompachi with uh, ama ebi and white soy dashi. And to me, it just reminds me of the flavors of um, growing up in Hawaii, as well as being able to travel when I got to travel to Japan um, and just enjoy the subtleness of the ingredient, but yet elevating it with a little bit of that caviar a relish that I put on the top it off. But for me, you know, just being able to taste that ingredient or that product is what for me highlights uh, food where you can taste ingredient, but yet elevate it so that it's got a little more different um, nuance to, to the flavors of, of the ingredient. Yeah, it sounds a lot better than the Petit Madeleine, actually. Uh, <laughs> so what do you call that, uh, Kampachi? What do you call that? It's a, it's, it's a, it's kind of my, Take I, I call it um, uh, from from ocean to sea. Basically, it's it's both uh, the deep sea ama ebi that's caught wild caught, and then the farm raised uh, kompachi, which is a a new way of sustainable uh, source. Because you know, with with the the fishermen now, sometimes it's it's hot and cold. Where you, you you can or can't find catch the fish wild fish. Where it's this product that they do at uh, the Big Island is it's got a nice marbling. It reminds me almost of, of like hamachi and papillo kind of mixed together. But it's it's basically called, uh, I call it um, from sea to sea. It's a uh, olive oil poached kampachi with a um, lanai ama ebi and a white soy dashi. People are going to watch this show. They're going to take notes. And I am going to call it Chef Collins Special Kampachi. That's what I'm going to call it. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Great Thank to you. have you on the show. I hope we can Thank do this you. again. Aloha. Appreciate it. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.